Well, good morning. If you all uh, want to take your seats, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome you uh, to Houston, the home of the world champion uh, Houston Astros. <laughs> we're very pleased to have you here. And uh, we're going to have uh, Ambassador Derision speak with you here in a minute. Uh, he is the director of the Baker Institute. And prior to uh, becoming the director, had a very distinguished career in uh, U.S. Foreign Service. Uh, really spanning uh, the administrations of eight presidents from John F. Kennedy all the way through Bill Clinton and uh, served as ambassador to Israel, ambassador to Syria, and also as the assistant, sec under sec se assistant secretary of Near East the Near Eastern Affairs under President uh, H. W. George H.W. Bush and also President Clinton. And uh, we're very pleased to have him here with us at the Baker Institute. So let me turn it over to Ambassador Curry. Thank you very much, George. George mentioned I was ambassador to Syria and Israel, and the reason I got those two distinctly different posts is they looked at my medical records in the State Department and realized I was schizophrenic <laughs> and, they <laughs> and that I could handle it. Well, good morning and welcome to Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. I, I wish to extend a very warm welcome uh, to all the attendees of this year's summit. It's truly remarkable that this is the 11th International Space Medicine Summit we have hosted here at the Baker Institute under the very wise leadership and competence of Baker Institute fellow George Abbey. Uh, and we're very happy to be partnering this year with Texas A&M University and Baylor College of Medicine. I'd like to welcome Jeff Sutton uh, from Baylor College of Medicine. Is Jeff here? Yeah, great, Jeff. How are you? You could come up in the front. You don't have to be so shy. <laughs> and uh, Mike Fosum from Texas A&M. Mike is here. Mike, how are you? Uh, who helped make the, the Space Medicine Summit possible. Uh, this is truly a very timely event. Uh, this year's summit comes when the new administration is reinstituting the Space Council under the leadership of the Vice President of the United States, which will define the future of the nation's uh, space policy. Perhaps I'm a little idealistic, but I hope we will regain the visionary approach enunciated by President John F. Kennedy at Rice University here in 1962 when he made that famous speech at Rice Stadium that we're going to put a man on the moon. This event also comes at a time when the private sector, represented by companies such as Blue Origin and SpaceX, are playing a new role in advancing space uh, exploration. Uh, one of this year's panels will be devoted to discussing the implications of this uh, very important changing environment. Space is a field, I don't have to tell this erudite audience, which time and time again has proven crucial importance of cooperation and coordination in a world that is bitterly divided. The International Space Station would not be flying today were it not for the strong international collaboration <clears throat> it has achieved. The station has become a model for how nations can work together to achieve common goals which benefit all and continues to provide the foundation for human exploration of space, strengthening international connections and communications are central to the aims of this Space Medicine Summit. I'm also pleased that the summit continues to emphasize the importance of education. Young scientists and engineers with new and innovative ideas and approaches will be needed to ensure a, f a healthy future for space exploration. For the past seven years, we here at the Baker Institute have sponsored a student exchange program with Bauman Moscow State Technical University in Moscow, sending American University students to Bauman and welcoming Russian students to Texas. At a time when U.S.-Russian dialogue is almost non-existent, this is rather unique. It has become a very meaningful experience for the participants who are left with a deeper understanding of space policy and the value of international cooperation in space. So in conclusion, the road to human exploration of space begins with the International Space Station and the understanding of the effects of long duration space flight on the human body. That's why your deliberations here are so very important at the International Space Medicine Summit. 
it will impact the future of space travel and have a meaningful impact here on Earth. So I wish you every success in your proceedings over the next three days. And again, warmly welcome you to the Baker Institute. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I think uh, everyone uh, here has got their badge. If there's a problem with your badges, uh, let us please let us know. Uh, we have transportation uh, coming from the Marriott over to the Baker Institute uh, every uh, morning and through the uh, afternoon and evening. So uh, logistics-wise, if you have any concern or question, uh, please let us know and we'll, we'll try to resolve it. Uh, Jeff, would you uh, like to say a few words? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Abbey, and uh, good morning. And on behalf of the organizing committee, uh, welcome everyone to ISMS 2017. Ambassador Dirigen, uh, thank you as always for your eloquent remarks and also for your kind hospitality in allowing us to have ISMS here in this uh, beautiful and inspirational setting of the Baker Institute. The uh, panels this year are blend of traditional favorites as well as some new panel topics that are reflective of progress in our field. Of course, the, the heart and soul of the summit are the discussions that take place, and it's so wonderful to look out and see so many friends and colleagues uh, who uh, have brought this meeting uh, together and made things possible for so many years, and to also see some new fresh faces uh, that represent uh, the future of our field. So thank you very much, and uh, I wish everyone a very productive uh, and pleasant next uh, few days at the summit. Thank you, George. Thank you, Jeff. Our uh, first speaker this morning is uh, an individual that uh, has, I think, a, a great uh, background and experience to uh, support a, a, a summit activity like this. Uh, and uh, he, I think, uh, better understands for the importance of utilizing the space station and making it the foundation for human exploration beyond Earth orbit uh, probably better than anyone. Uh, he was uh, not born in Texas. He was born in South Dakota. But he got to Texas as quickly as he could and uh, was raised in McAllen. Uh, he uh, went to Texas A&M University, uh, received a, his degree uh, in uh, mechanical engineering, and then uh, was commissioned as a lieutenant in the U.S. Air Force and uh, got his master's degree at the Air Force Institute of Technology in uh, Dayton, Ohio, and then was detailed to the Johnson Space Center to support shuttle operations and uh, got here in time to support uh, the third flight of the shuttle on. He was subsequently uh, selected to go to the Air Force Flight Test School, graduated from there, and was assigned as a flight test engineer at Edwards Air Force Base. And then in 1992, he uh, left active service with the Air Force and came to work at the Johnson Space Center in support of uh, International Space Station operations, and uh, was subsequently selected as an astronaut in 1998. Uh, flew uh, two, two uh, space shuttle discovery flights, STS-121 and 124. And then in uh, June of uh, 2011, uh, he was launched on a Soyuz spacecraft to the International Space Station from uh, Bakanor Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan and uh, spent 167 days on board the space station. Uh, he uh, retired from NASA in uh, 2017 and he was subsequently uh, named as a vice president for Texas A&M University and named the chief operating officer for Texas A&M Galveston campus. So let me present Mike Fossum. Thank you, Mr. Abbey. Friends and colleagues, it's, uh, when you look up here at this image of the space station, hanging there, in space with the uh, earth behind and that black sky and the curved horizon. That's a dream that we weren't sure was ever going to happen. 
I wasn't sure it was going to happen. Now, like Mr. Abbey said, I had a long history around Johnson Space Center. I was in mission control after a landing in 1984 when President Reagan first announced the space station program. You know, it was exciting. Uh, lots of big dreams and odd, what we now would think of as odd designs. Uh, I went away for eight years, and when I came back, it was really just in time to get involved with the uh, redesign of that space station program that kicked off in the spring of 1993. Uh, with my experience at NASA earlier, my experience developing uh, systems and human interfaces in the Air Force, I, I jumped in uh, to that redesign. Uh, some of you were involved in that. The, the, uh, one of the oddest things in that entire process took place in the, the summer of 93 when they announced a new partner in the space station program, the major partner, that Russia would become a major partner and we would redesign major parts of the station and the entire program to incorporate this new uh, big partner. Uh, that was really... Uh, Earth-shaking in a lot of ways because the, the the thought of we'd had some cooperation some minor partnerships But nothing as huge as this and indeed through that th Partnership we became dependent on each other and what an amazing thing you know former adversaries now bonded together working together uh, there were a lot of late nights weekends as we figured out how the, all these pieces would come together and I for one at times wasn't sure we could even do it. But I underestimated something. I underestimated the sheer willpower and force for Mr. Abbey. Where's Bill Shepard? Where are you, Shep? Yeah, Bill Shepard that helped lead that effort, as well as other similar people that are driving hard with an unwavering commitment for other parts of our partnership. So we kept pressing forward and things were coming together. We started a phase one program where we had uh, Russian cosmonauts flying on the space shuttle uh, for space shuttle missions. In 1994, Sergei Krikalov became the first Russian cosmonaut to launch on a space shuttle. In 95, then, Norm Thagard became the first American to launch on a Soyuz spacecraft as he joined the, uh, uh, the uh, Mir crew in progress. One year later, in 95, we had the first uh, docking of a space shuttle orbiter on STS-71 to the Mir space station. What an amazing thing. Finally, in 98, we launched the first element of the space station, the FGB, or uh, Zarya control module. Shortly afterwards, we launched the space shuttle and installed the US Node 1, or the Unity module. It was two years later when we finally got things moving with uh, the delivery of the uh, service module to be make the station habitable. Shortly afterwards then, Expedition 1 took up residence in the space station with Shep, Sergei Krikalov, and Yuri Gudzinko 17 years ago yesterday. It's amazing. It's hard to believe it's been that long. We've had a continuous international human presence in space ever since then. Today, of course, we have Expedition 53 with three Americans, two Russians, and one Italian still continuing to carry on the mission. We've learned so much from this partnership. Number one, we've learned how to build what's probably the most complicated engineering feat the world has ever seen. Individually, maybe not, but when you combine the efforts of all our countries and the need to pull everything together and integrate it together, and many of these pieces never touched each other on the ground before they were actually attached on orbit, and it all worked. It's a miracle. <laughs> we've learned a lot about operations, and we've learned about sharing the work, the partnership that is stronger than any other disagreements that we might have. The space station, we've learned so much from its development, and we have so much more to learn, and that's really the importance of these kind of conferences, to work on these things, to figure out the challenges we have. We have challenges with the human body over the long duration. Six months, we have a lot of data on crew members for over a six-month period of time, a small amount for crew members over a longer period of time, and what we've learned is we can keep people healthy on a great big space station that's about the size of a 747 inside. 
with exercise equipment that would looks almost like it would belong, well, it doesn't look like it would belong in a local gym, but big exercise machines, big treadmills that uh, football players could use on the ground. Uh, but we know that those kind of exercise devices will not be making the long journey beyond low Earth orbit. And so we have the challenges of miniaturizing those, figuring out how to keep our crew members healthy. Um, and and it, it's very different from what we have now available on ISS. Another major thing that, we have, that we're continuing to work on and we need to continue driving hard is the use of this unique orbiting laboratory as a place to test out the technologies for exploration. When we launched the, and it's just an example and not to pick on some of my friends, but when we launched the carbon dioxide removal assembly 17 years ago, we thought we had tested it out. We thought we'd worked out the kinks. We thought that it would work fine. 53 crews have been working on the carbon dioxide removal assembly. Uh, having to perform surgery on it in ways that we uh, weren't trained to do on the ground even. Uh, and that's a problem. Why, do we, why can we not, as engineers, how can we not figure these things out yet? And we're moving too slow. We need to get the chain, we need to accelerate the upgrades, the next idea, and have time, years of operation to test it out. The same is true for our water purification system as we collect the condensation and most of the water from urine and turn it back into coffee. <laughs> but it's been a problem. And the, uh, the, fortunately, the space station's just 400 kilometers away, and we can get spare parts up in a matter of months as we, as, uh, as we need to. So it's quite a supply chain that is keeping this amazing laboratory flying. But we won't have that supply chain when we leave low Earth orbit. Even setting up the potential outposts or way stations around the moon are significantly harder to resupply and repair than this orbiting laboratory is. When we one day, and I can't wait to see it, when we one day light the engines and leave the low Earth orbit, the vicinity of Earth, to head to Mars, which we're going to do, we're gonna to have to have systems that can handle years of op continuous operation without failure, purify the war water, the air, keep the crews healthy, keep them protected from radiation, keep the, the, give them the kind of nutrition that they need. I see some nutritionists in, in here. The, the nutrition they need to, uh, to stay healthy, to maintain their health for the trip there and the trip back, and hopefully for a nice long life afterwards so we don't leave them crippled in some way because of their long exposure. By coming together here and discussing the results, the challenges, and inspiring each other, inspiring our space agencies, our governments, our universities to think, to think big, to think hard, to put the resources into this endeavor, we can solve these problems. But we cannot do it alone. The United States cannot do it alone. None of us can. We've got to do this together. We've got to come together as one voice with a clarity of vision and a, and, and a definite purpose. And doing that together, we built a space station. We can do amazing things, and the best is yet to come. Thank you very much. I think we're ready for our uh, first panel. And uh, so the panel members want to come forward, and we'll go ahead and get that started. I think we need a place for Paul with us. Uh, oh, we don't have any chairs? Yeah. Well, we can take mine. I'll just stand here. Just do a name tag for him? Yeah. Paul, well, Paul, you're up here. I'll be the anonymous panel. <laughs> Hi, good, right. How are you? How are you? So you're going to stand for that? Yeah. 
think we got everyone. Let's see. Well, this is our first uh, first panel of the morning, lunar exploration, and uh, the moderator of this panel is going to be uh, Leroy Chow. Uh, Leroy. Uh, He's a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley. He got his uh, bachelor degree there in chemical engineering, and then went to the University of California at, uh, at, Monterey, at uh, Santa, Barbara. Santa Barbara, and got his uh, master's and his PhD there. And uh, he was working at uh, Livermore National Laboratories in 1989, uh, when he was selected uh, as an astronaut in 1990 by NASA. and. Uh, came to the program here in Houston and subsequently flew uh, three uh, shuttle missions. Uh, flew in 94 uh, on Columbia. In 96, he flew on uh, Endeavor. And in the year 2000, he flew on uh, Discovery. And then in uh, 2004, he uh, went to uh, Kazakhstan and was launched on a Soyuz and spent uh, six and a half months in orbit on the International Space Station and uh, landing in April of 2005. And uh, in December, he went off uh, into the private sector and he's been in the private sector since that time. In 2009, he was uh, selected as a member of the, uh, the uh, committee that uh, d reviewed the human spaceflight program uh, led by uh, Norm Augustine and uh, tried to lay out a roadmap from uh, 2009 on. And so we're fortunate to have him as a moderator this morning. I'll turn it over to you, Leroy. Great. Thank you, George. Thanks. Well, it's really a, a pleasure to be here participating in the 11th uh, ISMS and honored to be, uh, to be moderating this esteemed panel here of, uh, of colleagues and friends. Uh, you know, I think the lunar topic is really timely. You know, I was, uh, I was an eight-year-old kid when we landed Apollo 11 on the moon, and uh, that was just the most amazing thing. Uh, I think all of us can remember what we were doing when that uh, event occurred. And I remember looking up at the moon almost a quarter of a million miles away and thinking, gosh, I want to be like like those guys who are up there uh, just about to go out and take their, their first footsteps on the lunar surface. So there are a lot of operational, technical, and scientific reasons to send humans back to the moon. And uh, But uh, as with anything that involves people, the politics have to be right or it's not going to happen. Right? In the 1960s, we had the space race, the politics were right, and NASA went from inception, just an idea, to less than 11 years later, landing Apollo 11 on the moon. So that shows you what is possible. Okay, so in 1969, we thought in 20 years, not only were we gonna have colonies on the moon, that was a given, but we would be on Mars. Right, so 1989, fast forward, that's when I applied to NASA. I had finished my schooling, uh, gotten my degrees, and I had uh, put my application into NASA. And it was a very exciting time because President Bush 41 had just announced the Space Exploration Initiative. We were going to go back to the moon, we were going to set up a lunar base, and then we were going to go on to Mars. And he had proposed a 24% increase uh, in NASA's budget. We had a White House and a budget director who were in line. They wanted to do this. They wanted to do human exploration uh, beyond low Earth orbit, and that was a great time to be applying to NASA to become an astronaut. Uh, of course, uh, a few years later, the uh, the Congress had other ideas, and especially when NASA came back with an estimated uh, cost of $400 billion, uh, Congress pretty quickly lost interest, and unfortunately, the SEI didn't end up going anywhere. So fast forward again to his son, uh, President uh, George W. Bush. Uh, he proposed after the Columbia accident, he proposed the Constellation program. That was going to bring us back to the moon, establish a permanent lunar base, and then you know go on to Mars. Uh, as, as George mentioned, in 2009, when President Obama was elected, I was uh, asked to be a part of this, uh, the Augustine Committee, and we were in charge of, uh, we were charged with uh, putting together option paths for the then new administration uh, to kind of help form the basis of a new space policy. And um, you know our instructions were, were pretty clear, very clear coming down from Rahm Emanuel uh, through Norm, that basically we were not to recommend anything. We were just supposed to put menus together. Uh, also, he said, forget about the moon. He said, that was Bush's program, so there's no way in hell we're going to do that. So the lunar option was off the table again. Now, fast forward to now, the politics, uh, you know, the same operational, technical, and scientific reasons are still there for sending humans back to the moon, but the politics are starting to line up. 
Okay, internationally, uh, Europe has been talking about the moon. Uh, Jan Werner has been telling people and going to conferences talking about his vision of a lunar village, international lunar village. He's been speaking with the Russians for a number of years, or the European Space Agency has been in discussions with the Russians for a few years now about doing a joint program to the moon. China, just a year ago, publicly announced what was already an open secret. They intend to send astronauts to the moon. Okay, and sometime in the 2030s, they intend to send astronauts to the moon. So the point is, somebody's going to go with or without the United States. And the United States, since we are the ones that have done it, we're the only country that has done it, we're the natural uh, lead partner on this project, just as we were for the International Space Station. And so the politics are starting to line up. And so uh, we've got a new architecture now with President Trump. He has sent us the sights back towards the moon, which I think is the right way to go. He's got an interesting new architecture that NASA's come up with, with a, a deep space gateway around the moon and a deep space transport. Now, of course, the catch is there's still no money for this program. The program doesn't even have a name yet. Uh, but at least we're hopefully shifting in the right direction. And if the politics line up, who knows? Maybe the funding will come as well. Uh, interesting wild card in this. The commercial sector, the private sector, okay? Uh, before, of course, of course, it's, it's absolutely true that uh, commercial companies have been a big part of our space program and any space program since the beginning, uh, but building spacecraft and other hardware under contract from the government. All right, now for the first time, we're seeing people like uh, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. Uh, they're not just in this to make money. Of course, they want to launch satellites and make money, but they want to use some of that money to either build infrastructure, in the case of Blue Origin, infrastructure uh, in, around, the, around the Earth and around the moon. And in the case of Elon Musk, he wants to colonize Mars. Now, last year, Elon Musk announced that uh, he had uh, a couple of paying customers who were going to basically fund a, an Apollo 8-style free return around the moon. Okay, so uh, even he is starting to look at the moon before going to Mars. So this sets up a very interesting time. I think uh, now more than any time, except maybe in 1989 when we were all pretty hopeful, uh, this sets up the time when lunar exploration might very well happen in the next uh, several years. But uh, anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panel. Uh, we, these panel members were selected because they represent people who've been on the moon, at least one person who's been on the moon, and uh, other people who have been very interested in lunar exploration and have other experiences as well. So in, uh, in alphabetical order, I'll go ahead and introduce each panel member and ask each panel member to say a few words, and then we'll begin our discussion, which will center around lunar exploration and international cooperation, as well as private companies and their role in supporting uh, lunar exploration. So our first panelist, uh, Jean-Luc Chrétien, very distinguished uh, French uh, cosmonaut or astronaut when he came to NASA. So he's both a cosmonaut and an astronaut. So jean Lou, he was the first uh, person from the West, from Western Europe, to go into space aboard a Soviet uh, uh, mission to the Salyut 7 space station. Uh, he then returned to space again on board space station Mir, and then trained in the US and became a NASA astronaut and flew on the space shuttle in 1997. He's a Brigadier General in the French Air Force, fighter pilot and a test pilot. Um, he was also participated in training as a pilot for the Soviet uh, Space Shuttle Buran program. So he's seen quite a few different, uh, different programs. He became senior vice president after leaving uh, the French Space Agency of Research and Development at Titronics, which is a software engineering firm here in Houston. And in 2002, he founded Titronics Optics, which is an optical technology company, and that is based in France. So Jean-Luc? Thank you, Laurel. Thank you, Mr. Abbey. Um, <coughs> you invite me to participate to this. Uh, oh, this thing won't stay. OK, I keep it in my hand. Uh, just a few words, I think, about all of us and the uh, interest to go back to the moon. Uh, with uh, time going, I've just uh, got uh, the final observations at the uh, moon and Mars are the only objects that we have in the solar system that we can visit. And that will be for probably a very, very long time. Many generations after us will also have to say that's all we have and that should be enough for those generations visit space. And again, the moon and Mars are the only things that we will visit. We hear a lot of words nowadays about uh, other planets far away from us. Uh, the visit of those planets might happen 
one day, but after we have gone through some limits that we don't know now, and that maybe the next generations will find out. But again, save the moon, save Mars, and go there, and uh, and keep keep quiet on there. Okay, thank you, John Lou. <clears throat> Our next panel member is uh, Bonnie Dunbar. Uh, Bonnie is, of course, known to everyone in this room. Uh, she was a former NASA astronaut, and she was served as the president and CEO of the Museum of Flight for a number of years up in uh, Washington State. And she also started and led the uh, University of Houston STEM Center recently. And then uh, currently, she's a professor of aerospace engineering at Texas A&M University, and also the director of the Institute for Engineering Education and Innovation at Texas A&M. Uh, Bonnie got to fly on four missions. Her first mission was aboard STS-61A Challenger, which was the German D-1 Space Lab mission. She then flew on STS-32, which is aboard Space Shuttle Columbia on the LDEF uh, uh, mission, which was a, a long-duration exposure facility for testing different materials and evaluating uh, how they behaved and how they held up in the low Earth orbit environment. She then served aboard STS-50, also on Space Shuttle Columbia, and was the payload commander of the first United States uh, microgravity laboratory. She returned to space one more time aboard STS-71, which was the first space shuttle mission to dock with the Russian space station Mir. So, Bonnie? Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to Rice and to Mr. Abbey and to everyone here for this opportunity. Is, is my mic on? I don't know, because uh, do we have an AV person to, or maybe you can switch here. Okay, I'll hold it too. <laughs> uh, I think like many of you, uh, you know, going to the moon was first an inspiration. Uh, there were uh, no astronauts and cosmonauts uh, when I started uh, reading science fiction or went up and looked in the night sky at, at Sputnik. And you kind of have to get bit by that bug. But there are many good reasons besides inspiration and exploration uh, for going back to the moon. We're actually very fortunate to have a moon. We have a place to go to test out technologies and concepts before we really commit to the long haul for Mars. As I tell my students, once you launch to Mars, uh, it, you don't turn around after 30 days because you got a problem. <laughs> okay, and and a, and a family that's steeped in history and Scottish history, I was reminded as a young, young girl about our first uh, voyages to Antarctica, and Robert uh, Falcon Scott and the the uh, royal ship uh, discovery that made the first scientific mission there. And we've been there now over 100 years uh, collecting data. Many nations are there. So why the moon? Well, it's a platform, first of all, for us to determine the thresholds of the physiological changes that we have uh, observed in microgravity. How much exercise do we need? At what point do we start losing bone? Is a 6G enough? We have no data between zero and one, and yet we're gonna design for Mars without that parametric uh, information. How to operate in a remote environment? The moon's actually easier to return from than Antarctica. It's three and a half days, and we don't have to winter over in Antarctica. But right now, I'm helping to educate the next generation that'll get us to either destination. Uh, the moon is more of a near-term laboratory. We need to have our students understand how to design for extreme environments, including the galactic cosmic radiations, uh, the radiation that we do not see here on the surface of the Earth, and life support systems in partial G. Uh, one third and and uh, or, and three eighths and one sixth uh, are unique environments. There are no vetted models on how liquids and gases behave in that environment, and and what we've been able to find on just limited exposures on the KC-135 parabolic aircraft that we no longer have says it's not going to follow our expectation. Life support systems, as we were listening about on carbon dioxide re uh, removal, are not always predictable. We have to acquire that data, and I think being on the moon, uh, acquiring the data in uh, how to protect astronauts from galactic cosmic radiation and other radiation sources, how to operate in a fractional G environment or partial G environment, how to design the life support systems is extremely important. When we go to Mars, they're gonna have to be reliable. We can't repair them all the time, and Home Depot is not down around the corner. Um, I'm really pleased to be part of uh, educating the next generation, and uh, we hope Texas A&M will be a leader in that area. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. 
Our next panelist, a very experienced cosmonaut, Oleg uh, Valerievich uh, Kotov. Uh, Oleg and I uh, overlapped for several years in Star City while we were training, and uh, Oleg went on to uh, to fly two long duration missions. He was trained as a uh, in the Kirov Military Medical Academy, becoming a physician, and then he was assigned as a as a career physician to the Soviet space program uh, before joining the the Russian cosmonaut corps. As I mentioned, he flew two long-duration flights and has logged nearly a year in space. His last mission was aboard uh, Expedition 3738, which he commanded, and uh, came back down in t September of 2013. So, Aljeg? Hello, everyone. It's, uh, again, it's confusing speaking Russian or English. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's a better say? What do you think? Uh, okay, uh, I will start with English, uh, just short introduction uh, with, uh, you know, uh, uh, first of all, is congratulations, Aster, with win, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> another one is uh, talking about the moon surface, uh, about the flying to the moon, returning to the moon. I don't want to say we really want to re only to return to the moon. We really want to come here to do something new, because uh, uh, no doubts for every space agency is looking forward to fly to the to the moon, to vicinity of the moon, to use a cislunar orbit or to uh, fly to the surface of the moon to build moon's village or moon uh, base. But uh, uh, from my point of view, the interesting uh, question is, or it's maybe it's issue, question, what's we going to stay on low Earth orbit? Uh, because it's uh, uh, everyone under understands that uh, we need to keep flying on LEO. Uh, it's impossible to uh, even imagine this. Uh, we all fly only to the moon or to the Mars and, and left uh, the LEO with any presence of human humanity. Uh, I know we, uh, NASA and uh, other partners are looking forward to the commercial um, usage of the LEO orbit, uh, but again, as we uh, try to, uh, to tr uh, calculate uh, market and understanding that it's not, it's not very profitable. So that means the government is supposed to cover the most expense for LEA orbit flights, even for commercial companies. Uh, so uh, maybe it makes sense to fly, continue to, to fly together, and maybe uh, to have some international commercial cooperation around the Earth on the Earth orbit and fly forward to the moon together, uh, starting with uh, deep space gateway uh, infrastructure, later on flying on the surface uh, as a, like a four post, uh, maybe uh, to build the base and future time. But uh, we, I'm agree with uh, Lero that we are now in a very interesting time here. So we need to decide what's the best way uh, we know uh, direction, then all agree with uh, main direction, go to the moon, to the Mars, and deep space. But how to do that? How to do that together? Uh, uh, how to work together, continue our cooperation uh, from ISS to behind? Again, thank you. Okay, thank you, Oleg. Our next panelist is um, Michael uh, Lembeck. And Michael is uh, an aerospace industry professional with over 30 years of uh, technical and programmatic experience in spacecraft uh, systems and engineering and uh, robotic and human spaceflight missions as well. He serves as the CEO, or the president, I'm sorry, of CEP Stone, uh, which is a company that uh, does system engineering lifecycle for, for aerospace hardware, software, and mission operations, and a whole lot of other things. So I'll let Michael tell Thanks. us a little bit more about Thanks what he does. Right. And uh, thank you, Mr. Abbey, for the unique opportunity to sit here among this distinguished group of explorers. Uh, as an engineer, I've gotten to see a, a number of programs come and go. Uh, it was 45 years ago, we're coming up on the anniversary that this gentleman got to walk on the lunar surface. As Mike mentioned, 17 years yesterday since the station started, and it's been almost six and a half years since the last space shuttle flight. And uh, yet I sit here today with a sense of optimism. Yeah, there's been a lot of changes in the 13 or so years since I led the last look at how you get to the moon with uh, defining the engineering requirements for that. 
And uh, we've seen a commercial cargo program come online. We're very close to seeing commercial crew uh, to start to fly back to the space station. Uh, the technologies have had impressive advances in miniaturization, automation, and uh, reusability. And so those things will come into play as we redefine what our next steps are. Um, but there's also been a loss of talent from government programs to some of these new commercial endeavors. So how we put together the people to do this job again will be a, an interesting challenge. Uh, the moon is retaking its rightful place in the, in the stair steps that we're going to proceed from to uh, get back out into the solar system. But the moon is not the end goal, and I know that uh, many of us here would like to also see us move on to Mars and not get stuck at the moon. So the National Space Council today is asking the right questions, what, where, and why, and uh, how, how do we put together the program to prove out the technologies to move forward into uh, space. Uh, one of the key things that Bonnie mentioned will be, you know, we all grew up here in this gravity well. How do we survive? How do we work? How do uh, we proceed to move out into areas with less gravity? And is there a threshold for gravity for the human body to perform well in? Uh, the space station has provided us an enormous amount of data. We're starting to see a lot of return from the twin studies, showing us just how difficult it is for the human body to survive in space. And in fact, it makes you ask the question, is zero G the right way to go places, or should we not, in fact, provide partial G to get there? Um, how we establish those goals, allocate the architectural elements, and make the resources available will determine the success of the next phase. And how we balance the government requirements to, to do a program that the taxpayers are paying for and, and that we want to do versus the commercial business goals. And uh, that, you know, both can have stability issues, as we've seen over the past bunch of years. So a moon village can bring together both of those elements and, and help to allocate those resources appropriately. But we also have to be wary of the moon as a trap for our ability to then move on to Mars. I mean, after all, space is an ocean, and you don't cross an ocean in a rowboat. And if we spend significant government investment in developing resources for chemical propulsion, we will kind of strap ourselves down in a lunar economy that will slow down our, ex our next uh, phases of exploration moving on to Mars. So there's an opportunity to balance those commercial interests with those things that the commercial folks can do well with the things that only the government can do, like developing advanced high-speed transportation options and, and nuclear propulsion, for instance. So I think we're going to see a lot of those uh, kind of questions raised. Hopefully some of them will be answered in the near future as the Space Council gets together with NASA, develops the next plans forward, discusses that with our international partners, and determines what is the right balance of commercial and government uh, resources to move on with exploration. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> Our next panelist, uh, Don Pettit, very well-known astronaut, very famous astronaut, invented the so-called Saturday, Saturday science, right? Saturday science aboard ISS, and uh, demonstrated a lot of interesting uh, physics, basic physics concepts in space, uh, especially for, for kids. Don is a fellow chemical engineer. Good. <laughs> and also, he also served as an, at the uh, uh, National Labs, uh, as did I. Uh, he's a veteran of two long-duration space missions and uh, one space shuttle mission. And he also went to the Antarctic to look for, uh, look for meteorites that might have come from, from Mars. At, uh, he's also has, holds the uh, distinction, I'm not sure if there's a distinction or not, as the oldest active astronaut currently. <laughs> So let's see, uh, I guess your, your last mission, Don, was in 2011 as part of the Expedition 30, 31 crew. So Don? If you look at where we have the technology to go with human beings, we've got about four places that we can seriously contemplate. We could do low Earth orbit. We can do something on the moon. We can at least talk about doing something on Mars. And then you could talk about doing something in the Earth, Moon, Cis, space. And this is about it in terms of where our current technology set would allow human beings to go. And we're already in low Earth orbit. And I think the next logical choice is to go back to the moon as a uh, human beings expanding out into the solar system. The moon is near, it's three days away. It's 
interesting. There's a lot of scientific investigations, a lot of things you can learn on the moon, particularly about the early phase of our solar system development, because these things haven't been eradicated uh, due to weathering like they have been on Earth. And then the moon is useful. There are resources on the moon to use that can allow you to bootstrap yourself to other places expanding into the solar system. So it's near, it's uh, interesting, and it's useful. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is by a fellow by the name of Kraft Ehrlich, and he said, if God intended man to be spacefaring, he would have given us a moon. <laughs> Thank you, Don. <clears throat> Our next uh, panelist is uh, the only person in the room to have walked on the moon. Uh, Harrison Jack Schmidt was a geologist, uh, of course, an astronaut, NASA astronaut, university professor, and also a former U.S. Sen senator uh, from New Mexico. He was the first member of NASA's first scientist astronaut group to, to fly into space, and he was also one of the youngest uh, people to ever walk on the moon. See, following this uh, Senate term, uh, Jack became a consultant in business, geology, space, and public policy, and he also served as an adjunct professor of engineering physics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and he's been a long proponent of uh, lunar resource utilization. Jack. Well, thank you, Leroy. Great to be with you. Great, uh, George. Good to be with you again. <laughs> George and I spent uh, many an hour as part of the lunar mafia trying to... <laughs> push NASA in different directions than they really wanted to go. Once or twice we were successful, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's great to be with you, part of this, this illustrious panel. Uh, I, I would just uh, emphasize, first of all, what has been said by Bonnie and, and others, that uh, the moon is probably an essential ingredient in our movement into deeper space because it gives us another data point in the gravity well, namely one-sixth gravity. Physiologically, with respect to this particular gathering, uh, if we start to see significant readaptation at one-sixth gravity, that's going to change your engineering approach, I think, to Mars uh, significantly. Also, the moon gives us a chance to develop some, uh, a wide variety of, of Mars applicable technologies, and I would just emphasize one right now, and that's spacesuits. Uh, the A7LB suit that we used uh, on Apollo 17 and the previous two missions uh, was an excellent suit for its time. Uh, it, it allowed us to do the, do the job that we wanted to do. However, uh, it was uh, designed for about a six cycle life cycle. It has, I think, influenced suit design now uh, significantly uh, for a long time. And, and if there's one area where engineering investment has not maybe met the need uh, internationally as well as uh, uh, domestically, and that's in uh, looking uh, imaginatively at new suit designs. Uh, suits that can last for 100 cycles at least before refurbishment, things like that really need to be dealt with. If you're going to establish bases and even settlements on the moon, uh, then uh, you're going to have to have, a, uh, I think, a whole new look at uh, spacesuits. Also, it's already been mentioned that uh, we need to look at how we get to Mars faster. And uh, one of the things the moon does supply, as many of you know of my interest in fusion, is helium-3. Helium-3 is an ideal space propulsion fusion fuel. Uh, we do not have significant amounts here on Earth. Uh, what we do have is primarily uh, from the decay of tritium. And uh, it's not uh, very cost effective to make a lot of tritium in order to make helium-3. The moon is a resource for that, and I think one of the answers to many of the engineering issues, as well as the phys physiological issues of going to Mars, is to get there faster, and be able to go anytime you want, and that's what fusion uh, allows you to do. And finally, uh, I would pick up on Don's point uh, about the science. What the moon is telling us, and uh, from a scientific perspective, 
is what the environment of the of near of the solar system was the uh, inner solar system was and possibly even the outer solar system uh, very early in that in the history of that system uh, and that is a period of time in which life was organizing itself here on this part of the planet and possibly even on Mars uh, it was a very violent time we know now we did not know that before we went to the moon but we know now that uh, that from its uh, origins to about 3.7 billion years ago uh, the moon and the earth and the inner planets were being bombarded by very large objects it was an extraordinarily violent time but it still somehow complex organic molecules were getting organized and uh, understanding that process is something that we're still working on but we at least now we know what the environment was uh, in that time and it's very possible that at least on the earth and mars that a, uh, a very complex mineral namely clay phyllosilicate for those of you who are in the game uh, played an extraordinarily important organizing role in that uh, process. These are thoughts that we did not have until we went to the moon and I'm sure going back to the moon and fully exploring that body is going to give us more new thoughts about uh, not only the origin of life but uh, the processes that were active in the solar system and what we indeed might expect to find on Mars. Hey, thanks Jack. Our next panelist is uh, Bill Shepard or as we know him as Shep. Uh, Shep, of course, was a former NASA astronaut and also a former Navy SEAL. In fact, uh, folklore has it during his interview process, he was being asked uh, what unique qualities would he bring to the astronaut office, and his response was, well, I can kill you with my bare hands. <laughs> so they decided to go ahead and select him. <laughs> So it's fitting that Shep was the commander of Expedition 1 aboard the International Space Station, launching from the Baikonur Cosmodrome aboard a Soyuz with uh, two Russian crewmates um, just two weeks after my last shuttle mission, uh, which was STS-92, uh, which we flew with uh, Koichi Wakata and other folks, uh, went up and installed some key pieces of the station just a couple of weeks before Shep flew up there. But he had three shuttle missions before that. His first mission was aboard STS-27 on Space Shuttle Atlantis, which carried a DOD payload. Next mission was on STS-41, where he, uh, the, the crew successfully deployed the Ulysses probe, uh, which investigated the polar regions of the sun. And then he flew on STS-52 aboard Space Shuttle Columbia, which uh, deployed the laser geodynamics uh, satellite and also conducted other microgravity experiments. Since leaving NASA, he was assigned as the staff commander of Naval Special Warfare Command. And uh, since leaving the Navy, he, uh, he's been involved in a lot of different things. I know developing hardware for special forces and probably a lot of things that he really can't talk about. But, uh, Shep? Thank you, Leroy. Um, I think, I mean, I, I view the uh, Space Medicine Summit as, as uh, a place to address a lot of issues that are probably a little bit beyond medicine, I, I think. George and the Baker Institute for hosting this. And I, I want to talk about uh, some things that, that NASA and the country and maybe the ISS partnership needs to address. I see, uh, going back to the moon, uh, we're taking too much of the short view on it. Uh, <clears throat> when this country was formed, uh, I talked to several people from the UK this morning. I really like beating up on the UK because I use this a lot in my public speaking. Uh, one of the things that happened early in the colonies was uh, the British government passed this thing called the Iron Act. Uh, this was done in 1650 and it precluded factories in England shipping uh, iron plate uh, to the colonies because we were supposed to be a, a resource for raw materials and a market for finished goods. And it was really the first instance of tech transfer, if you will, that was at least written in the law. But it really backfired because what happened in the colonies was uh, it, it provided the furnace for all kinds of innovation and industrial development. And by the middle of the 19th century, there were a lot of things going on here that really outstripped uh, what was happening in Europe. And I think it's part of our DNA. It's, it's, it's really part of our global society now that we've, we've got to have this. And so 
I think going back to the moon, as uh, Bonnie and others have said, we're going to find things there that, that don't work right or that are broken. We have to have the, the ability to recognize that humans are tremendously adaptive and creative beings, and we can't legislate to them exactly what's going to happen because nobody knows. We have to have the capability in situ on the moon and on Mars to invent, develop, build things that are unique to that environment. And we have to have the moon as a place to learn how to do this. Uh, we saw this a little bit on the space station. Some of our proudest moments in Expedition 1 were several instances of, of being told by the, the ground, both in Houston and Moscow, something could not be done. And two or three days later, we'd get a call from Houston, they say, hey, well, that, that thing that was not working, we, we're, we're getting signal down, and, and it, it's, it's back on. And we, you know, what's going on? And we said, well, you know, we, we spent a little time over the last two or three days, tore it apart, and fixed it. And they, the, the ground was apoplectic because we had no procedures, and the cedra was one of the, the main offenders, if I might say. And um, so the ground said, well, you know, how did you guys do the work without screwing something up. And they, and they said, well, you know, we just, just took the risk and did it. And they said, you want, we can go back in and break it if you want us to do that. And, and Houston said, no, no, stop, just, just keep it running. But the point being is humans have a lot of untapped intellectual capital that we need to really refocus. Uh, one of the best things that I think ISS has brought to the table is the international approach to solving problems. I learned a lot from the Russian space program, from the Canadians, the Japanese, even ESA once in a while. And NASA should have a very aggressive program to capitalize, to combine the best of all these international solutions to problems, but I have to fault our own space agency because this is not a priority. And this is probably one of the most important things that I think would come out of, that should come out of ISS, and it'll be vitally important when we go to places like Mars. And the moon, the moon is the place to learn how to do this better. My last uh, laser bullet, if I might, uh, I'm very concerned about the space program in terms of what I would call lost art. Uh, we flew to the moon 40 years ago. Most of the people that did the design, the engineering, and the math on how to do that are in the ground somewhere. Uh, we had a really good reusable winged vehicle that went to space and came back. Those are all in museums now. And I would bet most of the knowledge and infrastructure on how to make that happen has gone too. And we do this over and over again. We've got to stop uh, this drainage of, of intellectual capacity on how to do these things. And I know we're going to talk about education <coughs> later in the summit, but I think this is also a key thing. All the more reason to have a very aggressive space program that includes a return to the moon. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Shep. Our next panelist is uh, Boris Shishkov. Uh, Boris uh, is the Deputy Director of Human Space Programs in Roscosmos, and is also the Deputy to Alexei Astelnikov, uh, which is Roscosmos ISS Program Manager. So, uh, Boris. Oh, did we? <laughs> oh, okay, you are. Уважаемые коллеги, для того, чтобы внести некое разнообразие в нашу дискуссию, я буду говорить на русском языке. Just to shake things up a bit, I will speak in Russian. Ну, в продолжение, в развитии того, что сказал мой коллега Олег Котов, я бы хотел представителю Роскосмоса 
отметить несколько моментов, которые сегодня нас очень интересуют, и в развитии которых мы предпринимаем конкретные практические шаги. Ну, первое основное мнение – это создание станции для We would like to use this station as a platform for further space exploration and for laboratory studies that will be useful in our mission to Mars. And as Oleg stated already, and as Mr. Shepard has mentioned, we should not lose sight of the knowledge and of the experience that we received already, and we should capitalize on all the experiences that we have accumulated on this space station. And so speaking of the practical steps, one of the key events that took place this year in September under the в котором, в общем-то, были отражены, мне кажется, основные моменты дальнейшей совместной деятельности. Да, 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 ну, для тех, кто не знает, конечно, я думаю, что многие... Во-первых, этим заявлением установлены стороны Роскосмоса, НАСА выражает намерение развивать сотрудничество в области исследования и освоения дальнего космоса, включая пилотируемые миссии и последовательные Стороны подтверждают готовность сотрудничать с партнерами по МКС и другими заинтересованными сторонами по разработке технического предложения по созданию посещаемой платформы на лунной высокоэлектрической галоорбите Deep Space Gateway. И подтверждают совместную использование, совместную приверженность использования МКС для подготовки к исследованию дальнего космоса с учетом развития научных технологий, включая разработку соответствующих международных стандартов и подходов по снижению рисков. Я думаю, что further into space. Этим And I think that в этом документе отражены основные направления нашего сотрудничества. Мы предпринимаем для участия в станции Deep Space мы находимся в начале пути. Огромный опыт получен ранее. Мы As was already mentioned, we have a lot of experience already, and we shouldn't lose sight of it. And I just wanted to thank everybody for giving me the opportunity to speak at this summit, and I wish all of you productive and. Thank you, Boris. And last but not least, our final panelist here is Paul Spudis. Uh, Paul's a studied geology at Arizona State University, interned at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, went on to Brown University, and where he earned his master's degree, and then re returned to Arizona State, where he earned his PhD uh, again in geology. He went to work for the U.S. Geological Survey and also became a PI for the NASA Office of Space Science Solar System Exploration Division and on the geology program. So his specialty is in the study of volcanism and uh, impact processes on the planets, including Mercury and Mars. He joined the LPI, the Lunar Planetary Institute, here in Houston, uh, went off to the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, and then returned to the LPI in 2008, where he served as a, a senior scientist. He was uh, also a member of the Synthesis Group when we were doing the uh, Space Exploration Initiative in Washington, D.C., and also was the deputy, deputy leader of the Clementine mission uh, to the moon, the science team. Uh, and that was one of, the, one of the successes that came out of the uh, uh, short-lived uh, Space Exploration Initiative. Paul? <clears throat> Thank you, Leroy. Um, I just briefly want to cover some of the things that we've discovered about the moon in the last 20 years. And uh, he mentioned earlier the, the, uh, the Clementine mission. That was actually the first mission we had had back to the moon since the Apollo program. Clementine was a polar orbiter, and it mapped the moon completely over the course of 73 days. And what we found was that the poles turn out to be a very interesting place. And they're interesting because the obliquity of the moon's spin axis is about a degree and a half. The 
ubiquity, the Earth's spin axis is 22 and a half degrees. So as a result, we have seasons on the Earth. But on the moon, the sun is always on the horizon at the poles. Now, because the moon has topography, this creates a very unique situation. Some areas that are high might be in the sunlight all the time, whereas others that are low, like crater floors, might never see the sun. And because of that dichotomy, we have a microenvironment at the poles that's unique. In other, what we found from Clementine, first of all, was that the peak areas near the south and the North Pole are actually lit for a significant fraction of the lunar day. Turns out areas near the South Pole are illuminated for about 94% of the lunar day, which is 708 hours. Uh, a peak at the pole in summer is, a, is, is fully illuminated for 100% of the time. So what this means is that we can establish a locality near the poles that can generate energy via photovoltaics all the time. So in other words, this solves one of the biggest problems we had in figuring out how to go to the moon back in the 80s, which was how do you survive the 14-day night? You don't have, you have to, the only way we could survive it previously was to have a nuclear reactor. And I'm talking about a megawatt class reactor that would generate power over the course of 14 days. Now we don't need that. We can actually establish a presence on the moon with existing power systems derived from station that will basically generate up to several hundred kilowatts of energy constantly from the sunlight. The other big discovery was the finding that these dark areas actually contain significant quantities of water. The first detection was actually with Clementine. We beamed radio waves into the dark area near the South Pole, and we got a reflection back indicating that there was specular reflections, a high, high circular polarization ratio in the dark areas near the, near the, near the crater Shackleton, which is right near the, the South Pole of the Moon. And it has since been verified by other missions that this is indeed water ice. The questions that now exist are how much water ice is there, what's its physical properties, and, and how easy is it to get to. Uh, a series of missions following Clementine, Lunar Prospector verified there was large amounts of hydrogen at both poles. And in a series of international missions, starting with the Japanese Kaguya mission in 2008, the Indian Chandrayaan-1 mission, on which I had an experiment, an imaging radar designed to map the radar properties of both poles. And then finally, the uh, two Chinese missions that orbited the moon in the early, around the year uh, 2010. And finally, the current Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which went into orbit in 2009, is is still operational today, and we have an experiment on that mission as well, a radar experiment that we're still gathering data from by using the Earth as a transmitting source, and we're receiving the echoes aboard the spacecraft looking for evidence for ice at both poles. The net effect of all this is to indicate that we have a place nearby in space that's easy to get to that is actually set up for a sustainable human presence. I like Don's reference to Kraft Erika's comment. It's almost as if this was created especially for us. We can actually get a foothold in space, and by foothold I mean not just to visit and not just to conduct a sortie mission, but a permanent presence on another world nearby using the materials that are already there. And I think the significance of this hasn't really fully sunk in yet. If you can provision yourself from what you find in space, effectively you could be in space indefinitely. You're not limited solely to what you can launch from the Earth, which is the deepest gravity well in the inner solar system. You can actually fuel and provision yourself, at least with low information density consumables, from extraterrestrial sources. So this is a major discovery. It's, it's begging to be taken advantage of. And I, for one, am encouraged that there are signs now that we might actually do so in the next few years. All right. Thank you, Paul. OK, let's go ahead and begin our discussion. Our, our two main topics that we want to cover is uh, lunar exploration and international cooperation, and also the role of private companies or commercial companies in supporting lunar exploration. And, and for the first time ever, we're seeing these commercial companies wanting to go out and explore on their own. So uh, audience members, please, we want you to participate in these discussions. So please raise your hand if you have a question or, or a, a comment to add. Uh, but I'd like to start with the, the lunar exploration and international cooperation. Now, of course, the Apollo program was born out of competition, quite the opposite. It was, uh, you know, it was a race for the high ground, and that was the driver for the United States to go ahead and push so hard uh, to get us to the moon so quickly. But in this day and age, in the age of the International Space Station, we've seen how uh, all these nations, former enemies, frankly, can come together and create something so awesome. As was mentioned earlier by Mike, uh, the ISS is by far the most audacious engineering project, construction project ever undertaken. And even those of us in the business were pretty surprised at how 
few uh, big big problems we had when we were putting it together. We all expected to have some pretty major glitches that that never really materialized. So in that light, um, you know, what is the role of uh, of international cooperation as we extend farther into the uh, into the uh, you know deeper space? And uh, the, the elephant in the room has always been China. China is, uh, has their own lunar ambitions, and so what you know is should we maintain that uh, is is the model of, of competition good you know better for getting us there or should we all try to explore together and if so uh, how do we bring countries like China into the fold uh, so to begin this this question I'd like to to ask uh, Boris Shishkov representative from Roscosmos uh, they have uh, Roscosmos has has said in the past they would have liked China to join the ISS program. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts of including China in a lunar exploration program? I think Oleg Kotov would probably be better suited to answer this question. I think you know, was, uh, I have an excellent answer, but this this guy wants push it out. <laughs> okay, we, so when we're talking about uh, uh, trying to involve the China partners to international space station, it's not easy to do, and uh, uh, so the main problem because uh, China has uh, his own uh, space program and is uh, pretty good design and uh, so they are uh, trying to investigate all te uh, critical technologies that need every space agency to uh, have a, to present people on earth uh, earth orbit on in space uh, so uh, we have a uh, few directions for cooperation. We work together for space vehicles, for space suits, uh, work together, uh, but uh, this looks like it's not a, like a government to government cooperation. It's better saying this like a industry to industry cooperation and relationships. Okay. So, I mean, are basically, is it, uh, is it kind of the position then that We'll work together, but we won't really have a program together. Is that? Uh, we hope uh, we will have a mutual program in future together. Flying, okay. um, maybe working together f uh, to continue flying uh, around the Earth later, or maybe to do some mutual program around the Earth uh, on on Leo, or maybe uh, we'll work together sometimes uh, during the Moon exploration, but not will later. Okay, thank you. And, and John Liu, I want to kind of ask you the same question. Europe has always had a kind of a more open mind for dealing first with the, the former Soviet Union and then with countries like China. And uh, what what is the difference? You know, how how is Europe able to um, have their politicians think that uh, cooperation is is a better idea, whereas America traditionally has been more U.S. centric? So, what what insights do you have to, to offer on on that? Um. Probably one of the main differences is uh, first with the budget. Uh, with roughly the same population with the European members of the space program, because not all of uh, the states of Europe are members of the space program, but it's roughly 300 something million people. We have about four to five times less budget. So that already makes uh, a lot of difference. And uh, so doing uh, with the border of uh, Europe, what is done here is, is, is impossible. So such projects, which become more and more, uh, uh, more and more uh, uh, expensive, uh, we have to look for cooperation. And uh, I know there are a lot of uh, encounters with uh, China. But the, uh, the result is that right now it probably would be the next step to do something together. But we are still in a state of observation. Uh, cooperation is, uh, it doesn't seem that China is as open as it was like a couple of years ago 
two, three years ago. But right now they are more, they went back to a, a closed position. But uh, sooner or later, and to go back to what we have all said later about the space exploration, we will need to cooperate. Going further down the road um, with a border program is not a good idea for Earth, Earth representation. I mean, the, the people on Earth are waiting for the Earth visiting space, not one country visiting space. Okay, thank you. And that's kind of more to, sh uh, almost to, uh, in a version of, of Shep's point of the Iron Act. You know, China, of course, after they launched their first astronaut in 2003, have on several occasions over the years uh, asked publicly to join the ISS program, only to, to be rebuffed by the United States. And so in a similar way, as the Iron Act spurred a lot of innovation and development in the early America, early United States, uh, China has now developed quite a bit of their own capability. In fact, next year we'll launch the first element of their own space station. So uh, do we have comments or questions from the audience on their, your thoughts on international cooperation? Any, any questions for the panel members? Any, any more? Yeah, I'd like to make one uh, comment. I, I think that our current, co current collaboration uh, also started at, uh, not at the government level, but at different working group levels, you know, whether it be on the biomedical level, uh, going back all the way to Apollo Soyuz, uh, or on the crew levels. Uh, so Oleg and I just came back from the Association of Space Explorers meeting in Toulouse, France. Uh, we're both on the executive committee. Uh, this is three years ago, so uh, we brought on uh, Yang Liwei from China, who's uh, attended um, they didn't attend this year, uh, but we did have a session on China and collaboration. Uh, in fact, uh, it was provided by uh, Kness as well as a French investigator. And uh, what they talked about was that these relationships have to start first, and also uh, that China has a, a vision for itself that's independent first uh, and developing a, an international presence in space, including the space station. Uh, we didn't talk so much on the moon, but on the space station. So I, I think it's uh, an evolutionary process. And uh, Kness did talk about how important it is to develop the long-term relationships on collaboration on research, for example, uh, before that next step is, is taken. So we'll see how that folds out, particularly with the new president, uh, Xi Jinping, and his vision for the future. Okay, thanks, Bonnie. Any other comments from the, the panel members on, on this? Jack? Leroy, I just would remind everybody that geopolitics is gonna be in space. And, uh, yep. and that you have to uh, you, you, at least understand that it's there. Uh, work as hard as you can to minimize its adverse impacts, but uh, there will be uh, geopolitical considerations on the part of all groups and nations that uh, have to be part of the mix. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, let's not get too idealistic that uh, somehow or another those are going to go away just because right. we're in space. Right, and it was interesting that, uh, you know, I was last year I was speaking to a fourth grade class and uh, talking about space exploration, and uh, one kid had a question, really a great question, and uh, came from this 10-year-old uh, who, who asked, well, you know, aboard the International Space Station, do you have, like, checkpoints? Like, do you have to show your passport and go across and, you know, to the different modules? And so, very well, uh, uh, very well, point very well taken. Shep, you have a? Yeah, I, I want to add to what Jack just said. Um, one of the things that uh, we felt was very important when the space station program started uh, which actually was very contentious between the U.S. and Russia, was the uh, responsibilities of the crew on board and what they were going to have the authority to do or not do. And the idea was that uh, because we had significant communications outages, because the satellite link was not active, that the crew had to have the authority when they felt it was necessary to do what had to be done. And this is not geopolitics in space. This is about managing an expedition that ensures uh, the safety of the crew and the integrity of the vehicle. And we've lost, we've lost that now, I think, to a large measure on how we manage ISS today. We've got to get that back because I think 
on a remote expedition, whether it's to the moon or to Mars, uh, you've got to have that. And the, the way to get that started is to have uh, good associations with the humans involved, that they respect and understand each other. And as Bonnie said, it's a person-to-person -person thing. I think that's what's important. And the politics have, to, at some point, have to take a back seat. Um, the happiest moment I had uh, flying the first expedition was after receiving days of contradictory orders from Houston or Moscow about what to do on a particular afternoon, I picked up the mic and, and, and told uh, both uh, Houston and, and Moscow that at the Blaha Mucha, I mean, that, that's, that's, US, that's Russian for that's BS because we have to have a single program that's managed for the, the benefit uh, of the, the people and the experiments and everything that's going on on the station. We, we need to get that back, and we don't have it now. And, and that's a good point, Shep. I guess maybe it's not so much geopolitics in space as geopolitics on the ground about space. I remember when uh, uh, there was a, a few years ago when um, uh, there was an incident where U.S. And, and Russia were at odds, and there was a, a big to-do about what was going on aboard the space station. And uh, there were these so-called experts who had nothing to do with the space program who said, oh, gosh, it's got to be horrible up there. It's like, you know, people who want to get a divorce, but they can't leave the house, you know. And I, and I, and I told a, a news outlet that nothing could be further from the truth. The one-on-one -on -one relationships, the friendships that develop, you can have different points of view and still be friends. And uh, I was telling them that I'm sure that everything was functioning properly aboard in that operations uh, aboard flyer with flyers on board that was the primary primary thing uh, any any other comments from the, the panel or any any questions from the yeah Dave thank you I mean I think um, I mean obviously China is the big player uh, in the room and we're thinking of expanding the international cooperation but I'd be interested in the panel's views on these emerging nations now, I mean, India in particular is a big, uh, is a big player, although they tend to be focusing on more on the launch capability. But the United Arab Emirates have said they're going to have a big ambitious plan and so on. So there's, there's a lot of people now, a lot of countries now being interested in space in general. And since I've got the microphone, a second question that's sort of related to the international aspect is, as the commercial endeavors are growing, and I know that's part of your yep. second phase, but there is an international component to that, and that has a different set of problems on the geopolitical side and the financial side and so on. So I'd just be interested in the view of, of, of the panel on, on those, two, those two points when it comes to international collaboration. Okay. Any other panelists like to take that on? Well, I'll comment briefly on the, uh, uh, you mentioned India as an emerging space power, and I, had the privilege of actually working with them on the Chandrayaan-1 mission, which was their first deep space mission. It was a lunar orbiter that was launched in uh, October of 08. And I found that to be a very enjoyable experience. Um, the, the engineers were, uh, it, was, it was a lot like working on, a, on an American mission. The, the, the ISRO facility in Bangalore is very similar to JPL. They have the same test equipment, the same procedures. They wrestle with the same problems. and. Um, there were two American teams actually that worked with the Indians and a European team. So there, it was it was quite an international mission. Now their next mission is getting ready for launch next year, Chandrayaan two. It has a lander and a rover, and that's going to be all Indian. So I think they I think they want to see if they can sort of do this on their own. But they have shown that they're very interested in cooperation, and I think there's a lot of benefit to that. Okay, yeah, Bonnie. Um, I might add that. Um, you see that collaboration and co cooperation actually starting here in the United States. We have a large number of rotating faculty and engineers from India as well as graduate students. Uh, so the processes and procedures uh, are adopted readily. There's some commonality and understanding of uh, where you go on a project team. And so that may be a, a good partnership in the future, especially on the delivery of hardware that might be in the critical path since we're already demonstrating that. So it's an evolution, like you were saying. First, it's the, the smaller collaborations that build into the bigger Yeah, ones. but I think the relationships are much stronger to make that happen in, in the near term. Right. 
Yeah, Mike? Well, there may actually be an interesting nexus coming between commercial and international with the advent of Bob Bigelow stations. His business model is to lease um, inflatable space stations in low Earth orbit to other countries. And that, I'm sure, will raise a whole other set of issues about whose flag is flying on that American vehicle, what laws apply, and so forth. Okay. Oh, is this uh, me? Leroy, just oh, quickly, I'm sorry, Jack, I, I want to take a, a tangent off of what Bonnie just said about, and she mentioned graduate students. One thing uh, we haven't mentioned is how critical it is for these programs, international or domestic, to be, to be primarily programs of young people. <clears throat> the average age, as everybody I hope knows, uh, in mission control during the Apollo 13 mission was 26 years old. <laughs> And these people had already been involved for years in this. The imagination, the stamina, the motivation that comes from having young people involved is absolutely critical to the success of future programs. And if, uh, if the countries don't realize that, if agencies don't realize that, and, and figure out a way to keep their agencies young and their industries young, industries doing that right now. Right. Now, whether you can stay that way, I don't know, because 10 years is about the limit. As George and I discussed many, many, many decades ago, you start to burn out. Most people, not all, but most people burn out at a particular job and need to move on to something else. Uh, so figuring out how to stay young is very important. And I would just remind people that there are programs that have done that. In the United States, it's the nuclear Navy. The nuclear Navy stays young. And they, because they, they have institutionalized that process. Uh, so just a reminder that if we leave young people out of this, it's going to be very, very tough. But uh, they may solve some of the international problems, too. Right. Oh, you're absolutely right. Uh, if, any, if any of you have ever been down to SpaceX and Hawthorne and, and taken a walk through their factory and, and seen the young people and the energy and the buzz there, uh, people uh, who are veteran NASA folks who have you know, long since retired have made comments such as, well, this reminds me of what NASA was like during the 60s, during the Apollo program. And so your, your point is very well taken. Um, Guillaume Wertz from the European Space Agency uh, wanted to come back to, uh, to China and to, to say that we are still discussing with China and we are pretty much doing the small step politic and trying to, um, to create opportunities for exchanges and learning more from each other. So there are, at least in the astronaut, uh, astronaut domain, uh, a lot of things which are currently happening. We are pretty much at the same level when we were with Russia uh, at the beginning of the 70s, mostly. So, but it's, it starts. But it also asks the problem about um, what, how, if we want to, to take China within the ISS, how will we do that with regard to the IGA, and how will we do that from the policy point of view? And, my, and I would like to have the panel point of view on that. And the third point is also, if we want to go to lunar exploration, in which frame will we do that? We want to do, we, I think it's pretty much common sense and com the consensus that we want to have an international cooperation, but in which form? How will we establish that? Do we go from the ISS partnership? Do we want to create a new IGA? These are very much acute questions which are also to be answered pretty, pretty soon because that will be the, uh, the layer on which we'll be able to build up this cooperation. Thank you. Right, and uh, as far as ISS goes, back in 2008, 2009, with the uh, uh, the beginning of the Obama administration, we had a president and we had a NASA administrator that was very much in favor of doing more with China and possibly even bringing them into the ISS program. Of course, certain uh, very vocal members of Congress didn't agree, and so uh, that didn't end up going anywhere. Now, technically, uh, I believe the Senzo uh, wouldn't take much to modify it to be able to dock to the ISS because uh, I know that their docking system, if not identical, is very, very close in design to the, the Russian design. Uh, but uh, from a policy standpoint, I guess that's a, that's a whole different uh, can of worms. Uh, and as we discussed in the beginning, it's the politics that are, are either going to make something happen or not. So would any of the panel members like to weigh in on, on that? Bit of a hot potato. <laughs> Shep, you look like you're thinking about something. <laughs> Nobody wants to touch it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well, let me just say one thing about sure. the early days of ISS. It was very important uh, when we worked uh, with Russia and the Russian Space Agency that um, 
that we had good government to government agreements. Um, there's a lot of buzz about what the capabilities of commercial space are now, but it was very important when a U.S. contractor was going to do something for NASA that the U.S. government stood behind that and said, you, Russia, or Europe, or Japan, or Canada, you don't have to worry about whether it's Boeing or Rockwell or Raytheon or somebody else, because we have a government agreement that, that is ensuring that we're going to perform. And that's going to be an important part of, of moving forward. And I, th I don't know how you do that in a commercial environment, and, because the business entities are about protecting their, <clears throat> their business interests, and it's, it's not the same equation. So that's something that has to be resolved. It'll be the same with the Chinese, I think. Right. Everyone has their own interests, and if, if the interests aren't aligned, it's, it's going to be a bit chaotic. Uh, let's see. It looks like we've got a couple other questions, and we'll move on to the commercial question. Go ahead. Uh, Bonnie first brought up the uh, issue of hypogravity and uh, the absence of data about human f d uh, physiology and deconditioning in the, in the uh, region between 0 and 1G. And Paul pointed out what a marvelous opportunity we have f for setting up not only habitations and laboratories. Now, Jack can assure us that a short visit to the moon is, is, is survivable, but I also recall, Jack, that you ran a panel on what would a lunar laboratory consist of if it, if it were aimed at looking at the biological and physiological uh, requirements and using 1 6th G as a critical point in the range between 0 and 1. Remind us of that. Well, it, it, that work was an outgrowth of uh, something that Bill Carpentier and I have discussed, uh, and that is that, that I think it's safe to say that with the exception of, of Skylab and, uh, and the, some of the Space Lab missions, uh, we have not had a, 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 a strong scientific basis to understanding space adaptation and to its uh, understanding how to develop countermeasures to its adverse consequences. Uh, and uh, I, I think as we move into the future, hopefully the various agencies involved can agree that we set up that so that for example, one possibility is flying uh, pairs of payload specialists who are physicians and who have only the job of understanding how they are adapting and then what the countermeasures that they use might be. That's been proposed but not, not done, except I, I have to say Skylab and, and a few other of the shuttle missions uh, uh, attempted that, where you have a uh, a broad and detailed characterization of individuals before flight, during flight, and after flight, and then you refly them. It, this is, space adaptation is such an individual uh, response to that new environment that g developing a large N is very difficult. Bill's trying to do that by looking back at the, at the old data. Uh, but I think we also have to look at the future and try to do something uh, somewhat more systematically and, and scientifically than we did in the past. Uh, and that includes now setting up on your, as early as possible, uh, facilities on the moon where you can characterize the adaptation if it's there to one six gravity. My personal feeling, I think we were adapting. But that's a gut interior feeling. We certainly were adapting uh, from a, a balance point of view, even though it doesn't look like it on the films, <laughs> uh, we were getting used to it. But you didn't worry about falling in 1-6 gravity. That's part of the problem, probably, is that it's not a great concern. Uh, but and, and, but I, really, uh, I really think that 1-6 is triggering some of the readaptation responses. But until we do that systematically and scientifically, we can't depend on it from an engineering point of view relative to designing uh, Mars 3-H uh, gravity uh, uh, systems. Uh, so there's a lot of work for this community to do in trying to convince uh, the various agencies involved, and, and particularly convincing NASA, uh, that uh, this needs to be an integral and extremely important part of the program. There are strategic issues involved here 
Uh, and uh, increasingly, uh, some of the groups like LEAG and others are trying to look at those strategic issues. And, and they do affect strategic engineering issues as well as strategic physiological issues. So, Jack, were you saying, are you saying that basically, you know, you kind of adapted to zero G on the way to the moon, and then when you were on one six G, was your balance system feeling it, or did you, did it start to feel it after a little while on the moon? Well, my, my, again, it's, it's, a, it's just an individual sure, yeah, feeling yeah, yeah. that uh, by the time we were exiting the spacecraft after a few hours in one six gravity. Uh, we had recovered, I think, so you could, you a could sense, tell, the sense yeah. of uh, the balance that uh, some days later when we got back to Earth, it took about three days yeah. for me to feel comfortable uh, walking and not turning and running into doorways. I don't know <laughs> the rest of you have done that or not, but uh, I'm not sure we should let people drive cars after they've been <laughs> in space, frankly. We, <laughs> I've been thinking about that yeah. for several decades now, whether that was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, that's interesting because uh, some of the experiments that uh, Chiaki and I uh, performed on uh, our first space shuttle mission on uh, the second International Microgravity Lab, we did study different animals and their balance systems, spinning them at different G levels to see what the threshold was where they would start reacting as they would on Earth. And uh, we found just kind of anecdotally, like you say, it's hard to get a, a large N, but uh, about one third G was about where that was. And I remember coming down on the shuttle on the, from that first mission and, and our commander was calling out the G level as we, we got into the atmosphere. And right about 0.3 G, I started feeling something. So it's interesting that at one six G, you can, you can adapt and, and Well, and hey, that. that's not scientifically Oh, no, neither, neither are mine, neither <laughs> mine. Just two pieces just, of anecdotal data. It, it just, <laughs> and, and if you look at some of the pictures taken, uh, even late in our three days on the moon, you will see that there's still a fluid shift going on. The, oh, yeah. The, this vein is distended in the forehead and things like that. Of course, oh, sure. it gets distended when I, when I was laughing <laughs> in those days anyway, so I'm, I'm never quite sure what was distending that vein. But nevertheless, uh, actually, I, th I think fluid shift had, had, had certainly changed, but it had not disappeared. Right. Buddy? Uh, I have one comment and one question. Uh, comment is very simple. I think it's very easy to understand that common sense is, win is winning sooner or later. Uh, from the very beginning, the political idea of flying to Mars without visiting and living on the moon was, was scary for me. I don't think uh, that we are ready for Mars and that will be ready in 10 years until we obtain experience how to live on the moon, how to make settlement on the moon, how to live under the reduced gravity, how to live uh, without atmosphere and all these issues. And uh, I think it's a certain type of suicide to fly to Mars before flying to the moon, because from the moon we can easily evacuate people if necessary. So, not to make the group of cowboys who are risking their life, but to make a real expedition. And I think, speaking about international participation, again, common science will win sooner or later, when we will really demonstrate common efforts not just plans written on paper that we're flying to the moon, China will join us. If we will stay on that, sti on that stage, just making protocols, of course they will make separate project. Uh, uh, question is very simple again. We're speaking about business and industry from the point of view of building something uh, near the moon or on the moon. What about uh, the profit for business of conquering the moon, of uh, uh, getting some resources from rare except gallium free, uh, about some other issues? I think to, uh, to attract the interest of business uh, is possible only if we can demonstrate they can get some real profit. Be building the gateway is interesting scientifically, but I don't think it's interesting for business. But making a settlement which can give us some resources or maybe some other benefits, I think we did not discuss that, what benefits we can get living on the moon and conquering it. 
Well, thank you, Vadim. That's a, that's a perfect segue into the, the second major topic of uh, commercial and private space and how that might fit together. Uh, very, very good comment about, uh, about common sense uh, taking over. Uh, I agree. I think that uh, I think most people here would agree that it makes sense to go to the moon first to make sure uh, all your equipment's going to work. Uh, we heard from Mike earlier about you know the surprises we had aboard ISS. We thought we knew how these systems were going to work. We tested them rigorously on the ground, but then in the in the actual space environment, it didn't work out that way. Uh, you know, I think, Mike, I think you mentioned the possible moon trap, you know, and I think you were talking more from a technology standpoint, technology development. Uh, but there are those that would argue, had argued against the ISS, saying if we build ISS, we'll never go to the moon. And now there are people who say if we go to the moon, we'll never go to Mars. And I don't believe that is true because the fallacy in that kind of thinking, uh, not, not your point, but uh, the one I just talked about, is that you're assuming that if you don't build the space station, you're going to get the money anyway to do go to the moon or if you don't go to the moon you're going to get the money to go to mars and uh, that's that's just not how it works but going to the commercial side uh, Paul, you, you talked about uh, an interesting way to balance, you know, and there's more talk about this these days with the new administration, about government and commercial partnerships. And, uh, you know, how would that look? I mean, Jeff Bezos, I, I don't really understand, maybe you do, I don't understand Jeff's um, business plan about building infrastructure in low Earth orbit and cislunar space, and it's almost kind of like a field of dreams thing. Let's build it and, and it, they'll come and set up commercial operations. So uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, Mike. Um, well, I, I think there's usually a pecking order here on how things get done. You know, politics, economics, and then finally engineering. And uh, we, we tend to design things that fit within the cost bogey that we've been given. Mm -hmm. And that's driven a lot of the engineering that we've had done on station, for instance. I think it's now uh, been reinterpreted in terms of the cislunar uh, modules that we're talking about at the moon. Uh, there's actually a little tinge of good engineering there because the moon is a lighter gravity well. It does make sense to put something there as a node. Uh, but the, the original constellation design for a lunar lander, for instance, was just pushed by a single requirement called any time return. How do we get the crew back from the moon at any time? Well, if we're going to stay, we can set up safe havens either in orbit or on the ground, and we can alleviate that requirement and reduce the size of the lander significantly uh, because we can take advantages of other elements of the architecture to provide the, the you know, safe havens that we need. So I think, you know, as we start to develop this, now we bring in the commercial element. And, it, and as was mentioned, the commercial guys are in it for themselves. They want to bring profit back. Sure. Um, you know, how can we say that they're going to be reliable? Uh, you know, if Elon or Jeff just happens to get uh, dropped off the end of a cliff somewhere, what happens to their companies? Will they continue to, to follow the paths they were on or, or what's going to happen after that? So I think what we have to see is the government has its space program. The commercial guys have theirs. And until the commercial guys can demonstrate a reliable capability that they're in business for making profit from and gives them incentives to stay there, mm -hmm. the government cannot necessarily rely on it. So for all of us that you know think SLS or Orion might be a wrong answer, you look around and we've seen you know how many years have we been waiting for commercial crew. Right. So the government has to maintain that capability. We have to continue to develop those systems. And if and only if the commercial guys can demonstrate it reliably, then we work them into the architecture and buy it as a service. Well, and I, and I think one of the, uh, there, there's kind of a, a nuance on that. Uh, and, you know, of course, commercial companies have been involved with NASA since the beginning. But, um, you know, you've got Blue Origin, you know, Jeff Bezos' company uh, some years ago took a NASA grant, you know, took some yep. NASA money, and found the, the experience so frustrating and so bureaucratic that he never wanted to take any more NASA money. And so, that could be a possible barrier, I guess, to the, the, the commercial, you know, a true partnership, a true government commercial partnership as opposed to contractor, uh, government contractor relationship. Well, in fact, there's another flip side to that. If you look at the Boeing commercial crew effort, for instance, um, you see a lot of complaints in the press that it's taken forever to get that development. Well, it's actually been driven by the finances that have been ma made available to them by the government. If Boeing had what they requested initially, uh, they would be walking around on the space station today. So uh, we have to ask, you know, where are the significant requirements coming from? Who's mm -hmm. paying for them? And then are they actually being implemented in a successful fashion? Okay, buddy. 
Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of commu uh, confusion in the press when we talk about uh, the commercial companies because I started out my career first in Boeing and Rockwell as an engineer, built the space shuttle Columbia as a commercial company mm, sure. under a contract. But the funding for that is the people's money, and there are certain legal requirements that the government spend the people's money in a certain way. Uh, as we move forward and we talk about joint contracts where everyone brings different resources uh, to the table, uh, it gets a little bit fuzzy, and then the government becomes a venture capitalist. Right. Uh, and then, but you st it's still the people's money. Yep. So we and, and we need to worry about the critical path and the skill level retention. Uh, one of the big concerns that I have uh, with some other people right now in life support systems is that as the um, the commercial uh, large companies have contracted, mm -hmm. but the development of the technologies for life support, which keeps crew up there, uh, was uh, uh, started out mostly at the Johnson Space Center, because that was responsible for people. So uh, Rockwell was bought by Boeing. Uh, Boeing does have a commercial crew. They have a lot of that intellectual property. Uh, Boeing built the Apollo command module. So what has happened now is that the expertise and intellectual property is, is um, uh, if, 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 if Boeing were to go away, Mm -hmm. um, it, it might go away. So how do we archive that? How do we make sure that what we've learned to keep people alive stays alive? How do we make sure the pipeline gets educated? Because right now, I don't graduate students that know how to design a life support system. Right. You know, they we have to put them into industry or into NASA. They have to work with senior engineers. Uh, most of the data is not digital. It's uh, archived in right. hard copies. If it so, still exists. So yeah. someone needs to be look at this, looking at the knowledge capture for the nation and to right. keep us competitive and how to share that. Right, and as was mentioned earlier, we, we couldn't build a Saturn V now and we couldn't build a space shuttle now. We've, we've lost that knowledge. Right. Don, did you have a comment? Uh, for uh, commercialization of the moon, I've got a homework assignment for everybody. <laughs> There's a science fiction short story written by Robert Heinlum called The Man Who Sold the Moon. It's an outstanding story. And one element that shows a little bit of devious nature of uh, these commercial folks, the, the first private crew that flew to the moon, they brought a number of raw diamonds with them. And then when they came back during their press release, they had some of these diamonds fall out from the sleeve of their flight suit, and, they, they, and, and the press saw this, and they thought, oh, diamonds on the moon. And they said, no, 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 there's no diamonds on the moon. We brought the diamonds. So they told the truth, but they set it up in a situation that everybody on Earth thought there were diamonds on the moon, and, and that could open up the commercialization. Anyway, it's a neat, it's a, it's a neat science fiction story. I don't advocate uh, trying to, to slant things in that direction, but it, it is an interesting story written back in the 50s, I think the mid-50s, about how to go to the moon and do it commercially. Okay, thanks, Don. And Jack, I know you have a comment, but I also wanted to ask you to uh, answer part of Vadim's question, which is, uh, what is the incentive for a commercial company to explore the moon? What, you know, you're, you're kind of an expert on, on what the moon has to offer, so uh, please have your comment, and then also answer the uh, uh, Vadim's other well, question. Well, I, I wrote a book on what I thought would be an investor <laughs> incentive, and that's helium-3 fusion, uh, which, uh, and if you want to read the book, you'll see the the uh, financial envelope that would have to exist, I think, at least uh, approximately for what, for investors to ultimately uh, get a return on investment uh, through helium-3 fusion. Uh, the, uh, uh, not much has changed since that book was written. Uh, natural gas has become more of a comp uh, competitor and things like that. The, uh, but I, I think that, uh, you know, in the long run, there's a real opportunity for the private sector to lead the settlement of the moon. Uh, it doesn't mean governments aren't involved because the, spa the uh, Outer Space Treaty of 1967 uh, requires that uh, signatories to that treaty be involved in uh, uh, one way or the other in their, uh, uh, their citizens' activities in space. Uh, 
and and that that side of things I think is very important. The on, the only thing missing from that treaty, in my opinion, and I, I think it's an excellent basis for future activities, is the absence of a claim regime. Uh, and uh, but uh, there is a precedent uh, in the uh, response, uh, at least of the United States and uh, and Europe, uh, to the. Uh, 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 Deep Sea Resources Agreement uh, in that they did set up a claim regime that they would recognize uh, as a consequence of their response to that, uh, uh, that, that international deep sea uh, agreement. Uh, so I, 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 th I think there's a way to do that. It's just going to take leadership probably on the part of the United States to make it happen. One thing I I'd want to divert a little bit to this uh, to the comment about uh, risk taking, in a sense, risk taking on the moon and whether you need to have safe havens and things like that. Uh, when you start to think about Mars, I think, and, and this is going to affect engineering as well as operational attitudes, but I don't think we're going to abort a landing on Mars. I think you'll abort to the surface, but not back to Earth mm -hmm. or to some safe haven. It's just too much of an expedition. Uh, in cost and effort and that's sort of thing, to, to not engineer things so that you can solve your problems once you've landed. Uh, I think we ha and that's, those kind of attitudes can be investigated, uh, operationally simulated and that kind of thing by returning to the moon. Again, only three right. days away rather than <laughs> potentially nine months. I hope it's more like three months. Right, right. Yeah, and, and moon is also operationally an excellent training ground for astronauts. You don't necessarily want your first crew on Mars to have never operated in a reduced gravity, reduced uh, atmosphere environment. Another question here? Oh, sorry, I thought you had the microphone. Okay, um, let's see. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, is there one over here? Okay, Dave? Uh, thanks. Um, just it's a couple of comments, and I think it's about the combination of the commercial side and the government side. I mean, obviously in this room, and, and, and most of the people we talk to, all this makes sense, right? We want to go to Mars, we think the moon's a great place, we need the technologies, we need the life support systems, we need all of that. And we all understand the interests of, of businesses is to make money. And I think, I think there's a way, I mean, I think we need to have a leadership, going back to the point of where well, there's a strategy developed that get, tries to get the best out of both of these worlds with the moon as a core. And that could be that if we are using the moon as a station or a base to go to Mars ultimately as a government, or to, and I should, I'd like to say hopefully international, so many governments, then um, we can use the ingenuity and the acumen of the business world. So maybe you're a client, you're your initial client, the way that Elon Musk has built his business for launch services. Um, and then mine those resources for government use and the innovation will come from the companies to make a profit on those resources that they're developing. And if we can develop that strategy, and that, that combines the, the goals that people want to, to, to achieve, how you go about it, but it also brings in the legislation and you go back to the space treaty. The, the US has a unilateral uh, law now that if you mine stuff in the moon, you can bring it back and sell it. Well, there's a lot of debate as to whether that flies in the face of the space treaty. And so the international community has to come together again with that strategy in mind and say this is what we want to do, this is what government can do to help it, and the businesses also have to sign on so they're not dropping diamonds out of their sleeve, <laughs> but they're actually seeing that there's a value to working with the government to help them achieve their goals, and there's a, there's a, a return on investment on that. And I mean, I think, I mean, it sounds idealistic, but I think that's the, that's the way forward, and we need to bring all these people together to, to have that conversation. Leroy, I, I would yeah, just, uh, relative to the Space Treaty and to that debate on, uh, on uh, the, I, I would just recommend Chapter 12 in that book that I mentioned uh, as an analysis of that. And, and the treaty does authorize, I think it's permissive, it authorized the use mm -hmm. of the moon. Just like and, the Antarctic. Yeah, and uh, well, no, it's not. <clears throat> oh, it's not. It's not like the Antarctic. The Antarctic, unfortunately, they uh, they avoided that issue. They had it dealt with in the original treaty, but then they uh, they revised it. So there is no regulation 
basically that if somebody opts out of the Antarctic Treaty, there's no regulation to govern the use of its resources. Whereas I think under the auspices of the Outer Space Treaty, that uh, that environment exists for that to be regulated by the uh, signatories to the treaty. Mm, I see. That's the difference. Okay. Yeah, the Antarctic Treaty is often, mm. I think, inappropriately used as, as a model, uh, but the much better model is the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. There's some, there's some because, enforcement built into it. Yeah, there, there basically is. People, there's an obligation by the signatories to okay. uh, to regulate their activities. Okay. Dave. But just, it strikes me listening to this, by this is a fabulous panel. Uh, uh, Bonnie said something, uh, you know, in terms of international collaboration, possibly involving research. And uh, as a scientist in the biomedical scientific community, I gotta tell you guys, the average age in this room is way behind. Uh, you know what's happening in the scientific world? We're sharing information like crazy. We're training each other across national boundaries, okay? And I could have had three more graduate or uh, postdoc students from China in the last four months if we hadn't had this barrier uh, to prevent us from training them. Uh, you can't stop the open scientific literature, and even companies that have proprietary information will play hell trying to hang on to that as a secret. So one of the serious things we need to think about is how to, how to maintain international co collaboration with uh, research, but at the same time, get the best out of companies through their competitive nature and their proprietary information. And, and this is, I think, the real challenge going forward. Uh, where do we get our information? How do we use it? Uh, how do we select it? Uh, where do we, how do we reach out? I do think, uh, at least in the biomedical area, we know we learn a lot more when we go across boundaries. There's no question sure. when we move across countries. And, and in fact, most universities now push us to have collaborations with China and India and anywhere else in the world we can. So I think the world is changing in this area and we just need to adapt with it and try to exploit it to maximize human uh, occupation in spaceflight while maintaining <coughs> national priorities. Cybersecurity's good. Oh, couldn't agree more. Yeah, Shep? I just want to make one, one final comment. It might be an interesting experiment to see if the ISS could be moved off as a commercial enterprise. And um, maybe the sunk costs that the governments have put in, you kind of wipe that off and have the thing run by itself. <coughs> and in the military, we have a special term for that. It's called a self-licking ice cream cone. <laughs> but it would be a very good model for how things might proceed on the moon uh, if that worked. And uh, that might be a way to figure out how to make a, a more commercial flavor to what we would do on the moon. Yeah, of course, of course, we've got to find a way. If, if we were able to do that, we'd have to find a way to uh, support those two big mission control centers uh, to still make a profit. Maybe, right? they would, maybe they'd have to change, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Money? Yeah, or like maybe they end up on the moon. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, you'll see that as a, as a possibility. It, the way to reduce costs is have your mission control on the moon. So I'd like to respond to the comment about uh, collaborating, particularly on biomedical data, that helps reduce the risk for exploration of crew members. We have a very small sample size in, and uh, so to hold it within uh, each nation makes it a longer process. Uh, the Association of Space Explorers right now has one, uh, had one standing uh, committee until uh, two weeks ago. That was our Near-Earth uh, Object Committee. It's, we've got a position in the UN there, and Rusty Schweigert helped to lead that a couple decades ago. We established two more standing committees, and Oleg and I are on one. It's about crew health, and we don't have, uh, we've just started, we don't have our white paper out, but what we'd like to uh, explore is, again, and the sharing of medical data for exploration, not only of the current crew members, but by complete unanimous consent of our attendees, 98. Uh, I don't know that we had all 37 nations there, uh, but complete consensus is that for those that of us have left the astronaut corps, to be able to share uh, into a repository our medical information so we can look at the long-term effects and be able to understand them better to help uh, mitigate what, what might happen. Not to prevent space flight, but to have all the information. Uh, so that's going to be part of what we're going to work on, uh, in a, in at least in an outline form for the next uh, six months. And then we meet again in March in Minsk, uh, Belarus, to continue our discussions. 
Bonnie, let me suggest that uh, you consider the issue. It's a tough one to talk about, but that's of autopsies. Well, they're, they're, it, yes. local jurisdictions are deal, hard to deal with, but it's been done before. There's a, the Department of Energy conducted a very long-term, 50-year uh, monitoring of uranium workers mm -hmm. uh, from the uh, mines, and uh, that was done at the Loveless Group in Albuquerque. Uh, so it can be done, but you, you're not going to get the basic information you need unless you have access to autopsies. And that's a, and and have organized it so you're you're getting the information that you want to have in that autopsy. And and that's an excellent suggestion. We'll be surveying um, as many of former crew members uh, as we can to determine. Uh, yeah, we, we. I think what has to happen is the agencies have to come together and form an uh, an entity that'll help look at all that data and analyze it. And I think some of the. I think Bill started it on the uh, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and Skylab data, looking back at the old data. But, you know, all together, we've only had a little over 400 people fly in space. And that's a small end to begin with, and looking at physiological parameters, and a much smaller number that have had long space flights or been beyond uh, LEO. So we, we well, do need to do something. The, this, this issue is particularly was, it's no longer viable anymore, relative to the cottage industry of lunar dust. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have uh, inhalations of lunar dust by 12 individuals, some of them, uh, like myself, four times, uh, four inhalations. And without an autopsy, uh, you're not going to know whether there was any permanent effect. Frankly, I don't think there was. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's not an issue, but you're not going to be able to prove that unless you have autopsy. Now, that opportunity is pretty well gone. You'll definitely be on my list. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to uh, add a uh, add a checkbox to the astronaut card. Autopsy uh, approved. <laughs> but in, uh, I'm sorry around. for speaking yeah. twice, uh, but uh, speaking about the diamonds from this coming from the sleeves, I like this story very much. It was published in the Soviet Union many years ago, and I think. It, uh, more than one million copies were sold. Uh, anyhow, uh, the point is, I think the treaty about the uh, Deep Space Gateway is good, it is a first step. I prefer another treaty. I prefer a treaty about international settlement on the moon to, uh, to involve commercial parts because settlement means technology of constructions, of getting power, of uh, making resources, so it gives an outspring of many technologies which could be interesting. Uh, making another station, this is interesting, but this is interesting only for the companies who are already involved. Settlement is another story. Another benefit of the settlement is science, of course. I absolutely agree with Madame Van Barr. I think uh, to get statistics, we need analogs on the moon. Only there we can define uh, the requirements, uh, the effects, uh, and uh, technologies for life on another planet. And uh, it's impossible on ISS, as for me, it's impossible uh, in analogs on Earth, but the settlement on the moon can give us a substantial benefit from the scientific point. And finally, if we proclaim that we are making that settlement, there will be many countries interested to be citizens of that settlement, not of the small station, which is limited, uh, from many points, but the big settlement, which can be uh, growing from time to time and uh, showing our presence not on not on the low orbit but in space. Thank you, Mike. You comment? Yeah, I think the gentleman makes a good point that the cislunar habitat will likely be one-dimensional in its ability to do economic development, you know, fuel trading. Uh, a lunar surface settlement has a lot of potential for doing that, and I always use this example when we were developing some of the original concepts for going back to the moon called Lembeck's Pub. If you look back to the original Lewis and Clark days, you'd find some little bar in the central U.S. where the French fur traders and the Americans would get together, exchange stories, and trade furs. 
And by establishing a pub on the moon, you'll get the same sort of benefits. But eventually, that pub gets dirty, and you've got to get some paper towel and clean it up. Where's that going to come from? Well, the Walmart next door. And the kid stocking the paper towel at the Walmart has a lot of cash. What's he want to do? He wants to go see a movie. So eventually, you start to build an economic settlement around just living on the moon. And I think that offers the most potential then for the commercial folks to come in and develop things and, and uh, make it self-sustaining. In a, in a broad stroke, that's, that's kind of what the European Space Agency has been promoting on their, their lunar, um, what do they call it, lunar uh, village. village, right? So. Yeah, and, and I, I think we should start this concept on the space station and have a pub module. <laughs> yeah. I got I, Leroy. I that tried to Fred? convince Deke Slayton and George Abbey and others that we should have a little beer on the uh, in the lunar module to get some good sleep too. <laughs> <laughs> Fred, to pick up on Vadim's point, in the it's not very well realized yet, but in the Authorization Act of 2010 and 2017 in the U.S. The long-term goal of the U.S. space program in sending humans into space is to expand permanent human presence, number one, and another part of that is to establish and enable a thriving space economy. So we already have the policy foundation to do this. We need to recognize it. The moon plays so important part in that. We need to recognize the policy foundation we haven't built on that in the U.S. And settlement clearly is going to be a piece of that as it moves on. All right. Thank you, Fred. Uh, well, we are getting close to time. We had the virtue of having an extra 15 minutes from being ahead this morning. Any uh, final comments from the panelists? Anyone wish to make a final, final comment? Any final questions from the audience? Okay, well, thank you all very much. Thank you, panelists. I think this was uh, really excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs>